Good morning, Liberty Church. How you guys doing? Man, I just want to say worshiping with you guys was amazing. Can we give it up one more time for our worship team and just using their talents to glorify God? Thank you guys. Man, we haven't had the, the privilege of meeting. My name is Kaiser, and I honestly have the best job out of anyone on the planet. I serve as a youth pastor here at Liberty Church, and uh, I just want to say this, that if you have a student, uh, I really believe we have some of the best students on the planet here at Liberty Church. They are, they're 100% into whatever's going on, and we're just spending time together on Wednesday nights, diving into the Word, getting in small groups, talking about Jesus, and so I'm thankful that I get to do what I get to do, and I'm thankful for all the volunteers that help make Liberty Youth happen, and so I just want to say Thank you for trusting us with your students on Wednesday nights, and I believe they're world changers. I firmly believe that. And um, before we dive in more, uh, I just want to give honor where honor is due. Um, I just want to say thank you to Pastor Josh and Kristen for for leading us so well. Um, Yes, we can give it up for them. They are amazing. And I thank you for this opportunity to to share with you guys this morning. Uh, My family and I, we moved here in April right at Easter. And we've only been here for a handful of months, but it feels like we've been here for years just because you guys are family to us. um, They they love you guys so well, and it shows by how well you love other people as well. So I want to dive in today. And um, can we just all agree that there's nothing worse, nothing more horrendous in the world than going to a drive through ordering your food, pulling out, making your way down the road, and then realizing they messed your order up. You're missing something, right? Like you, you pull up to the drive through and first off, we all know the speaker box is, they need to upgrade that, okay? Because you, you can barely hear them, and you're yelling out of your car window, like hoping they could hear you, and you just rely on the thing they're typing on the screen to make sure it's right. So, you know, you guys know the scenario. You pull up to the drive through You're ordering. You're probably picking up food for your family, maybe your friends, whoever you're with at the time. So you're going through your text messages, trying to get all the orders correct. You are pulling up the app to see if you have any deals or coupons or you can use the Chick-fil-A points they give out. Hallelujah. Right? And then you give them your money. They give you the food. And you begin driving down the road. And that's when you realize they forgot the french fries. They forgot the drink. You're missing the kids' chicken nuggets that you ordered. There's no sauce packets in there. And then you're left with a decision. And if you've been driving for any amount of time, and if you've been married for any amount of time, you've probably made some of these decisions and you've learned from those. But the decision you make is going, I'm just going to continue moving forward. I'm just going to keep driving because it's not worth the eight minutes through traffic to go back and fix this. We'll deal with this when we get home. Or you say, you know what, it is worth the eight minutes of trouble. I'm going to go back and I'm going to fix this. If you're anything like me, the first couple times this has happened, you said, I'm going to go home and I'm gonna, we're just going to deal with this. And if you have kids, that is not the right choice. <laughs> right? Because you show up to your house and with the missing items and then disappointment sets in. Frustration sets in. Four-year-old hanger sets in. And you're sitting there going, hey, buddy, it's okay. Like, we can share chicken nuggets. And if you're over the age of three in anyone's household, sharing food is not the same as if it was my own. And so you're dealing with all those emotions there. And then you go through it. You're like, man, they missed the fries. They missed the drink. So I'll just eat the little cheeseburger they put in there, and, and then my, my wife, you know, she's like, hey, you, you can have the meal I ordered. They actually got that one right. I don't know why, but you can have that, and I'll eat cereal. And you do that enough times, you start getting smart. You start going, you know what? It is worth the eight-minute drive back. I'm going to go back, and I'm going to fix this. Or you, you, this happens enough times. This happened to me on more than one occasion. Um, you start getting smarter. When they start handing you the bag, when they start handing you the food, the first thing you do is you start digging through it in the drive-thru line. You're not moving. You are just, they got the fries, they got the nuggets, they got my drinks. And when you are 100% sure that you have everything you've ordered that you paid for, then 
you drive off. Then you pull away from the restaurant. And here's the thing. I know this analogy is silly. I know this analogy may be, may be lighthearted, but this is what I've learned. And I share that to share this with you. In life, I figured out that I can keep on driving. I can keep on moving down this road of life with a few small things missing. We've all been there. If you have kids, you forgot the diaper bag. You said, we're going to make do. But what I've also discovered is in life, you cannot keep moving forward or building a life when specific things are missing. There are some things you have to take with you. There are some things that just have to be in place, especially when it comes to our spiritual life, especially when it comes to our relationship with God. There are certain building blocks that we need to ensure that are in place. And today, I just want us to put some pillars in the ground. Today, I want to put some stakes, and I'm going to put a stake down in the ground in my heart, and I want to do a quick inventory assessment to make sure we have everything we need before we continue on. And before we go any further, I'm just going to ask if you would pray with me. Heavenly Father, right now, Lord, we give you this time. God, speak to us. Let your word pierce our hearts. God, let us leave encouraged. God, let us leave here different than the way we came in. God, I pray that uh, no matter what distraction we may have, no matter what is happening after church today, no matter what uh, thing is stressing us right now, God, that we can just hit pause for, for 10 minutes, for 20 minutes, Lord, to focus on what you want to say to us. Jesus, we love you. Jesus, we praise you. In your name we pray. Amen. So we're continuing our series, Dear Church. Actually, today we're concluding it. We're wrapping it up. And uh, what we've been doing in the series, Dear Church, is we have been looking at a letter the Apostle Paul wrote to the church of Rome. And in this letter, Paul wrote, it's, it's actually, you could say it gives us the blueprint for life. It gives us the blueprint for spiritual life. And that life that Jesus talks about in John chapter 10, that life that you can have to the full, to the abundance that vibrant life that he gives, like we can find that life in Romans. And, and what I want to do is that, you know, if you were here for week one, I want to do a quick recap with you guys. If you were here for week one, we heard from Pastor Clint, and he laid it out plain and simple for us. He said, dear church, love God with sincerity. Love God with sincerity. And if you were here last week with us, we heard from our friend Pastor Donnie, which, um, by the way, uh, if you guys saw the jacket he was wearing, coolest jacket, the, the coolest thing, right? I thought it was awesome. Uh, maybe just me. I don't know. But um, last week we heard from Pastor Don, and he said, dear church, it's our time. Dear church, it's our time. And I just want to say, if you missed out on those messages, I encourage you to go back and listen to them. Pastor Clint, Pastor Don did a fantastic job in, uh, of just relaying truth in that, and I would, don't want you to miss out. On that, But as we dive in today, as, as I said, we're looking at this letter the Apostle Paul wrote to the church at Rome. And I just want to do some quick history for you guys in case you forgot or in case you guys may not know. Just a quick history. The letter Paul wrote to the church of Rome was written in A.D. 57 to A.D. 59. It was about 25 years after the resurrection of Jesus. And what I think is so fascinating about this letter that Paul wrote was that this is the clearest, most systematic presentation of Christian doctrine that is recorded in all of Scripture. Paul wrote this letter for a couple reasons. The first reason Paul wrote this letter was because the church in Rome was, was disunified. It was fractured. It was divided. And Paul's heart was, hey, we need to have a church that is united. We need to have a church that is together, on mission for Jesus, together. And so he wrote letter for that primary reason. The second reason he wrote this was for practical purposes. Paul knew that if the church of Rome could be unified, if they can come together, they could become a staging ground for Paul to take the, the message of Jesus further west, all the way to Spain. So practically speaking, if the church of Rome could be unified together, Paul could continue the ministry and reach out to those further away. And so the reasons these reasons are what motivated Paul to write out the fullest explanation of the gospel, Jesus' life, his death, 
his resurrection. And what I think is so amazing is that we can look at a letter that was written so long ago for people who lived so long ago. And yet we can still apply it to our lives today in the 21st century. It is still applicable to you and to me. And so today I want to look at Romans chapter 12. If you have your Bible, you can open it up there. If you have your YouVersion Bible app or whatever app you use on your phone, you can open it up. Romans chapter 12, we're going to be starting in verse 9. It says this. Love must be sincere. Hate what is evil. Cling to what is good. Be devoted to one another in love. Honor one another above yourselves. Never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor, serving the Lord. Paul is writing here to the church and he says, your love must be sincere. Your love must be active. To have a sincere love, it requires an active participation on our parts. Another translation uh, says it this way, and I love it. It says, don't just pretend to love others really love them. Don't just pretend. No, no, really love them. And I don't know about you, but for me, that hits differently. Because you may be better than me, but I'm really good at pretending to love people. I think down south, we are really good at pretending to love people. Because down south, we call that being polite. I had uh, something happen to me a couple years ago. My boss at the time, he's now my mentor in my life. I had some tension when I was working at a church in uh, Richmond, Virginia, and I wanted to resolve that conflict. I wanted to resolve that tension with a, with a coworker. And so I was on the phone with my boss, and I was t talking, how we, should we address it? How should we do this? And I was almost home. I remember I was driving down our street, and he said, Kaiser, I want you to listen to me. This needs to be addressed. But when you do, don't just be polite. And you know what I mean when I say that. Don't just be polite, but be kind and be loving. And I knew what he was saying. Because I'm so good at just sitting there in conversations with people and feeling warm and feeling welcoming and smiling and having conversation. And on the outside, I'm presenting like the most kindest, loving person, but on the inside, I feel like the complete opposite. And, uh, and, and Paul is saying, hey, the outside is one thing, but the inside is what we're getting at. Don't just pretend to love people, really love them. Love is intentional. Love is active. Jesus said in John chapter 13 that the world will know you are my disciples by how well you love one another, not how polite you are. To people. It requires an active participation on our side in church. If our love isn't intentional, if our love isn't actionable, if our love isn't active, we're slipping. Because just a few sentences down, Paul reminds us to never be lacking zeal. Paul's encouraging the church in Rome and us today not to be lagging behind, not to be falling behind, not to take the back seat and have this passive love, but to be active in that. He's saying don't be lazy, but have great enthusiasm. Have great energy in our pursuit for God and our pursuit for other people. I think Paul wrote that because he understands as life goes on, times can get tough. It can wear you down, and if we're not intentional, it's easy to drift. It's easy to be passive. It's easy to take a back seat. Easy to get off track. And Paul is writing, he's saying, dear church, never be lacking in zeal. Never be falling behind. Rather be diligent. Live with earnestness, striving, pursuing, keeping your spiritual fervor, serving the Lord. He says that in verse 11. Keeping your spiritual fervor, serving the Lord. But what does that even mean? This word fervor, it literally means intensity. It literally means passion. It literally means heat. It means hot. And so to have spiritual fervor is that person who's just like, I'm all sold out. I'm ready. 
It's a faith that is active. It's not a passive faith. It's, it should ooze out of you in everything you do. And I think you've, if you've been around church any, any length of time, you, you know what I'm talking about because you've encountered people where you're like, man, I talked to you for, for five minutes and, you're, and I just feel energized. I feel ready. I feel like I'm just like, ah, right? Like you're just excited. That spiritual fervor, the people are saying, like, man, when I'm spending time with God, like, man, I just feel this sense of just strength. I feel this sense of energy that just is supernatural. I don't even understand what it means. Spiritual fervor is that person who sits at the feet of Jesus. They hear his voice. God, I'm going to chase after you with everything I have, and I'm going to listen to you. And what you say, God, I will do it. That is what they're doing. It's having the right attitude. It's having the right focus. It's knowing that Jesus is the one that sustains me. It's not my time. It's not my talent. It's not my abilities. It's only Jesus that is the one that holds me up. It's him and nothing else. When you talk about spiritual fervor, that intensity, that heat, this is, it's knowing it's about Jesus, not about me. And this is the one that I have the hardest time with, church. It's getting to a place where I'm more spirit dependent than I am self-dependent. It's knowing that I can trust and rely on the Holy Spirit to guide me, not my own. Nothing of myself as I'm fully invested. I'm fully holding on to the Spirit. And Paul is saying, dear church, keep your passion. Keep that fire. Don't let it die down. And it's easy to have spiritual fervor if you go on a mission trip and come back home. It's easy to be amped up when you go to a conference and you come back home. It's easy to be amped up when you're doing big things in your life. But here's the thing. Eventually that fire is going to die down, and you have to keep it going. And what I love is that Paul doesn't just leave us there. He gives us more. But when it comes to this topic of spiritual fervor, I have an, a question that I must answer. You have a question you must answer. When it comes to the topic of spiritual fervor, we all have to answer this. What area of your spiritual life has cooled off? Has your devotional time shortened? Has your generosity thinned out? Has your prayer life become stagnant? Has worship become more about song selection and your preference rather than the Savior that saved you? I'm sure if we all took an honest assessment and we looked in that bag before we drove off from the drive-thru, we would say, there are some things that I once thought I had that are missing. There are some things there that I would say I was once thriving in that I've slowed down. But the good news is Paul didn't just leave chapter 12 at verse 11. He continues on. And so right after he says, don't lose your spiritual fervor. Don't lose the zeal. He gives us specific ways to keep that going. And he says this in verse 12. Rejoice in our confident hope. Be patient in trouble. And keep on praying. The first thing Paul writes right after he says keep your spiritual fervor is be confident in your hope. Rejoice in our hope. And it's a great reminder to ourselves saying, my hope is not found in my circumstances. My hope is not found in the promotion I seek or the financial status I hope to get to one day. My hope is only found in one place, and it is Jesus Christ, and who was and is and will always be the hope that I have. And if you've been holding on to something else besides that, I want to let you know, that when you put the weight and expectation of God on anything other than God, that thing, that person, will eventually crumble underneath the pressure that's put there. And it's going to leave you more empty, more hopeless than when you first started. And so what I think that Paul is trying to say is to keep that spiritual fervor, is hold on to the hope We can say it this way, dear church, praise, praise. Dear church, praise 
Jesus. We have a reason to praise him. Hebrews chapter 6 verse 19 says, This hope that we have is trustworthy and strong. It is an anchor for our souls. That hope is Jesus. And when I think of praise, I think of, I think of worship. I think of living a life of worship. I think uh, tangibly what that, that can look for us is, is being saying, God, you're, you're number one. I'm going to let go of the thing I was holding on to, and I'm going to turn to you. And I'm going to lift my hands, and I'm going to praise you. There's a Hebrew word. It's yada. It means praising with the extending of hands. It means I'm going to do this. And what I think is so cool is this is the international sign for surrender. But this is also the sign for victory. When your team wins, we're up. We're here. It's the same thing. It's saying, hey, my hope is not in what I have. It's in who, who I know. It's in who I trust. It's Jesus. And, and when I think of the practical side of, of raising hands, um, I think when it comes to worship, you may be in this room and you hear the music play and the worship team does a, just a fantastic job of leading us. And you see people raising their hands and you're, you're struggling going, I don't know if I'm holy enough to do that. I don't know if I'm okay enough. Like, you don't know what I wanted to say to my kids on the bus ride. The bus ride, if you have a bus and you bring kids here, congratulations, by the way. You're doing way better than me. I'm not gonna, ever going to have a bus. Um, but a car ride, <laughs> on the car ride here, Right? You know what I, what I was wanting to say to him, but I'm a Christian, so I couldn't say those things to him. And so I can't lift my hands. Doing this doesn't mean I'm holier than you. Doing this means I'm just being honest with myself. I'm saying, God, I trust you. I want to be close to you. I have a, two kids, three-year-old and a six-year-old. And they come to me, and when they want to be held, they want to be close to me, they hold their hands up and say, Dad, pick me up. Hold me. And, and so they pick their hands up, and I pick them up, and I, I pull them close, and they hug me, and we, and we talk. I think the same is true when it comes to our worship is, God, I just want to be close to you. God's our Heavenly Father. He cares about you. God, I'm going through some stuff. Would you please hold me? Would you please let me be close to you? Because life is hard. What I think is also really cool is science has proven that, that this praise it's actually helpful to us that we are wired that way that scientists have said if you are stressed at your job because you're about to do a presentation, if you are stressed in your work environment because something is going on, they say go to a quiet place, whether it's the, in your office somewhere or somewhere else. And they said raise your hands above your head for two minutes and look up. Science has proven that that will lower your stress levels significantly. And so Paul is writing, dear church, praise, praise, praise. I'm going to hold on to the hope that is Jesus Christ and trusting in his good plans for my life and reminding myself that I'm not defined by my situation. Dear church, praise. The second thing he writes is, I would say this is, dear church, be stubborn. Dear church, be stubborn in the good ways. Be stubborn in the right ways with stamina, with patience, with perseverance, because he continues on in, in verse 12 and says, be patient in trouble. Others want to say, be patient in affliction. It's almost like Paul knew we were going to go through some stuff. It's almost like he knew that we were, were going to encounter troubles in this life. And he says, the way you get through is being patient. And what he means by being patient is honestly saying to remain, to abide, to stay with. Here's the truth. In this life, we're going to have trouble. Jesus said it so himself. He said, but take heart, I have overcome the world. Remain with me. Abide with me. The one thing that I have to remind myself constantly when trouble comes my way is Jesus said very clearly, he said, this world hated me. It's going to hate you too. And he never put an asterisk behind there. He never said, the world hated me. He's going to hate you except for Kaiser. You're safe. He didn't put that in there. He was very clear. Trouble is going to come our way. But when that trouble comes and everything's trying to convince you to walk away, you're saying, I'm going to cling to the hope that I have. 
when all your friends have their hand on the doorknob to Christianity saying, I'm about ready to walk out of here because this thing is not living up to my expectations of what I think it should be. And saying, hey, I'm going to hold on to the confident hope that I've discovered in who Jesus is. And I'm not going to let go. And when everything else out there is telling me and, and just unmotivating me, demotivating me from digging deeper into my relationship with Jesus, when there's nothing motivating me externally to go after him, I'm still going to remain. John chapter 15, Jesus says, I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me, if you abide with me, you will bear much fruit. But apart from me, you can do nothing. He didn't mince words on that one. Jesus was very clear. Patience is saying, God, give me grace to stay even when things are not looking good. Because I'd rather sit here with you in the chaos and the storm around me than go out there and be by myself. Because I have hope in you. And patience, some people say it can look like weakness. And I promise you it's not. Because at that point, it's all about me. If I'm being patient through affliction, I'm being patient in trouble, then it's about me. It's not about him. And I guarantee you that even though you're going through something, God's got you. He sees you. He's not surprised by your circumstance. He's not surprised about the thing that you found out 10 minutes before you got here. He knows it all. And I'm going to choose to hold on to what is true. So he says, dear church, be stubborn. Don't let anyone... Don't anyone pull you away from the hope that you have. The last thing he says is, I would say, dear church, faithfully pray. He says, keep on praying. A consistent life of prayer is a life that's dependent upon Jesus. And that's how we go from being self-dependent to spirit-dependent. Here's the thing I know is true is, is all everything can look great on the outside, Liberty Church is amazing on the outside, but here's the thing. If you take a look under the hood, where it all starts is with prayer. It's the engine that keeps this thing rolling. It's, it's the thing that keeps us going and saying, God, I'm going to trust you. And, and when I, my life, my prayer life has become stagnant, it's because I've taken the posture of I've got this. When I need to start saying, God, you got this. I'm going to spend time with you. My dependence upon Jesus is where I get my real strength from because there's one thing I've learned in this life is I'm a limited resource. But God's unlimited. I only have so much time. I only have so much energy. I only have so much bandwidth, but there's more out there. There's the abundant life that's only found in Jesus. One of the biggest predictors of Christians who fall away who, who walk through that door of I'm out of Christianity is their devotional life was not a priority anymore. It took a back seat. One of the biggest predictors for marriages that fail is when devotional life, your time alone with God, growing in a relationship with him is no longer a priority in your marriage. When you remove God from something, things become so much harder. And I think what Paul would want to say to us and what I would say is, dear church, remain faithful. Dear church, lean in. When times are tough, don't lean out. Lean in. If you don't get anything else out of today and and I just want to encourage you with this is just do this. Every day this week, spend some quality time with your Heavenly Father. Praise Him. Just say, Jesus, thank you for saving me. Spend time talking to Him about the thing you're going through of, of Jesus, I'm going to be with you no matter what, but I'm going through some things right now and it's tough. Spend time just praying. If you don't know what to say, the most powerful thing you can say is just Jesus. Just say his name. But spend time this week 
talking to him, reading his word. Spend five minutes and just saying, God, I'm going to be faithful in prayer. And I'm not going to be asking and requesting from you because so many times we treat God like a vending machine that if we say the right type of words and the right combination, we're going to get the results we want. But if we just say, God, I'm, I'm here, I'm available. I follow you. Wherever you say, I, I will go. I will do it. That's the prayers we need to have. And I believe that there's a, a few, few different groups, two different groups of people here today. I believe there's people in this room who maybe don't know God. And maybe you're sitting here going, man, I'm going through some stuff right now. It's hard. And I, I don't know why you... You walk through the doors today. This may be your first time here. I don't know why you click the, the link to check us out online. But today may be your day where you say, you know what? I'm done fighting. I'm going to give my life to Jesus. Because I've tried it on my own. I keep hitting obstacles. I keep stubbing my toe. And you told me about this guy who can give me life and life to the full. I, I want that. I want to follow that. And so if, what I want to do is I just want to go into a time of prayer. I want to pray for two different ty types of people, two different groups of people. So if you would, bow your head. Close your eyes. No one's looking around. It's a moment between you and God. If that's you saying, man, I'm tired of doing this life on my own. I need my Savior in my life. I need Jesus in my life. If you would, just slowly lift up your hands. We want to pray for you. No one's looking around. I see you. Thank you. Thank you. If you would, everyone together, we just say this prayer as unified, as one. Pray with me. Dear Jesus, thank you for saving me. I give you my life. I choose to follow you. I'm sorry for all of my sin, but I trust in you. And from this day forward, I will follow you. I love you. Amen. And the second group I want to pray with right now is maybe you've been walking with Jesus for a while. Maybe you've given your life to him, you know, earlier in the year or when you were a child. And you said, you know, there are some areas in my life that have cooled off. Things that were once a priority are no longer a priority. And I want to pray for you. I want to pray for strength. I want to pray for the restoration of that passion. I want to pray that, that God will just prick your heart a little bit deeper this week so that way you will feel just that, that longing to go, I want to spend time with my Heavenly Father. So again, every, every head bowed, every eye closed. If that is you saying, I have cooled off in some area of my life, but I want that again. Would you raise your hand? I want to pray for you. I see him. I see him. Thank you for your honesty. Thank you for your honesty. Heavenly Father, Lord, we come to you right now. And God, right now, I want to lift up every single person here who's in this building, who's tuning in online. God, who says, hey, there are areas in my life that have cooled off. God, that they would cling to the hope that you give. Not the false hope that's out there, God, but your hope. The true hope that's out there, God. And Lord, right now, I pray that you just pierce our hearts this week, God. You... You, you, you lay little breadcrumbs for us that we can notice you in the world around us, God, that we could give you thanks, we can praise you, God. And those who are going through circumstances right now, God, I pray that would lay them at your feet. God, that they would say, God, I'm gonna do what I can with this, but I know you can do more than this. And so, God, I'm gonna do my part, but I know you're gonna do yours. So I leave it at your feet, Heavenly Father. God, I pray that as we go out into this, this city of Pensacola, God, that we can just walk with the confidence of who we are in you. Jesus, you are amazing. We thank you and we praise you. In your name we pray. Everyone said, amen. Thank you, church.